Hello and welcome to the third part of lesson four. This video concerns combining Cauchy's momentum equation with a relationship that provides a link between shear stress and material deformation, a real logical constitutive equation. This link will include the fluid's resistance to deformation, a property that we now know as viscosity. The constitutive equation that we'll be using is the incompressible Newtonian constitutive equation, which is well suited for the flow of liquids that don't contain any structure or long chain molecules. The end result will be the Navier Stokes equations, which can be used to calculate the flow and pressure drops of any incompressible Newtonian fluid flowing through any geometry. So, on the board is my starting point, which is Cauchy's momentum equation. If you remember from the last part of this lesson, Cauchy's momentum equation was simply the application of Newton's second law, F equals ma, to a continuum fluid. And the result that we got consisted of a volumetric statement of forces, so we've got forces per unit volume. The forces consisted of forces that act on the bulk of a fluid, body forces, that act on the surfaces of a fluid element, surface forces, the mass per unit volume, the density, and then two different types of acceleration, a time-dependent acceleration, something accelerating from rest, for example, or a spatial acceleration, for example, how a steady flow will accelerate into a contraction. But there's, there's no time-dependent change in that fluid flow when viewed from an external reference point. And so here is Cauchy's momentum equation. Remember, too, that those two acceleration terms inside the white brackets on the right-hand side can be condensed in terms of a substantive derivative, big D by big DT, which allows us to quantify time-dependent changes and spatially-dependent changes. So what we're going to do is to use Cauchy's momentum equation we're going to be more specific about what we mean by stress, that sigma term, and then we're going to introduce a rheological constitutive equation that links shear stress to strain rate, and that involves terms involving velocity. So let's start by thinking about stress. So in previous parts of this course, in lesson three, for example, we wrote this statement down here that the total stress in a fluid is equal to a hydrostatic component plus a dynamic component. Sigma equals minus pi plus tau. We made that statement and we didn't really explain it in any detail. So I'm going to take the time to explain it here. Let's imagine my little differential unit cube again, sitting in a Cartesian coordinate space, and think about what we mean by the first part of that sum. What about pressure? What's going on with pressure? If we think about submerging this little differential cube underwater, it's so small that we know that it will experience equal pressure acting on every face, and that pressure will act inwardly like I've drawn on the board. Now, if we think about which direction and which face those pressures are acting upon, we can say that they're acting in the principal directions, aren't they? They're acting normal to each of those three faces. Not only are they acting normal to each of those faces, they're acting in the direction that the face is oriented as well. So, for example, if we look at the blue arrow, that is a pressure applying on the y direction face. That pressure is also applied in the y direction. Same for the green arrow for the z face and the orange arrow on the x face. And so, really, what we want to try and do is to convert this scalar description of pressure because pressure, after all, is just scalar. It's the same value of P. But we need to give it more information. We need to give it information about the face it's acting on and the direction in which it's acting. Because, as we can see on that equation at the top, we can't add a scalar to a tensor. We know we're not allowed to do that. That, that disobeys the rule of rank, rank homogeneity. So we have to give pressure a tensorial description. And all I mean by that is we just have to state on that diagram, in which direction those pressures are acting and on which faces. And we can see that the orange arrow is acting in the x direction on the x face, the blue arrow is acting on the y direction on the y face, and the green arrow is acting in the z direction on the z face. So all we really need is something to give us that information. And the identity tensor, bold i, 
is exactly that, because the identity tensor is just a matrix, a three by three in this case, because we've got three directions in our coordinate system, that is all full of zeros aside from the elements on the principal diagonal. And if we think about which directions and faces the principal diagonal means in, for example, the stress tensor, it's the XX for the first bit of the diagonal, the YY for the middle bit in blue, and the ZZ for the last bit in green. So multiplying the scalar pressure by the identity tensor gives us all the directional and face related information we need to adequately describe how pressure is acting on my little differential cube. So let's expand my stress tensor by taking the divergence of it as it appears in Cauchy's momentum equation. So we've got del dot sigma. That's simply going to be equal to minus grad p because grad now is my gradient operator. It's a vector in Cartesian space, d by dx, d by dy, d by dz. And I know the dot product of a vector with a tensor, gradient operator is a vector, sigma is a tensor, gives me a vector. So I'm adding vector to vector to vector, so that's fine. So del dot sigma equals minus grad p, minus because the pressure is acting inwards, plus del dot tau. And tau are those stresses that result from deformation of the fluid. So let's think a little bit more about how we quantify that deformation. And this is where we need our real logical constitutive equation, because we're going to link that stress resulting from deformation to the rate of deformation, the velocity fields that cause the material to deform in the first place, as we saw in lesson three. So let's remind ourselves how in lesson three we wrote the Newtonian constitutive equation for incompressible fluids. Big tau, the stress due to fluid deformation, is equal to viscosity times the rate of deformation. So the Newtonian viscosity in green is simply a scalar. The rate of deformation, the rate of strain, is second rank tensor. And we know it's symmetric because we know stress is symmetric. So we saw in the previous lesson that the rate of strain tensor can be written as grad V plus grad V transpose. And it's the addition of grad V to its transpose that gives us that symmetry. So what we can do is insert that Newtonian constitutive equation into del dot sigma, which equals minus grad P plus del dot tau, which is del dot what's in those yellow brackets. So let's think carefully how we expand that out. And if we take the divergence of the quantity in those brackets, and you can prove this quite easily in Cartesian coordinate space, del dot grad V effectively is equivalent to the grad of del dot V. And del dot V for an incompressible fluid is zero. That's my equation of continuity. This is why we're looking at incompressibility, because it's a really nice, simple case that is widely applicable to just about everything that we're going to examine. If we look at del dot grad V transpose, we simply end up with the Laplacian of the velocity field, del squared V. And if you're unsure of this, go and prove this in Cartesian coordinate space by writing down the inner product of grad V with the gradient operator and the inner product of the gradient operator with grad V transpose, and you'll see that this is true. So we can simply write that the divergence of my stress tensor sigma is minus grad P plus mu del squared V, which is really nice and compact. And we can use this now, finally, to get from Cauchy's equation of momentum to the equations of momentum for an incompressible Newtonian fluid, the incompressible Navier-Stokes equations. So there's Cauchy's momentum equation. The left-hand side is rho total dv by dt, or substantive dv by dt, so it's the spatial and temporal acceleration, equal to body forces plus surface forces. And we've just discussed surface forces in some detail, and we know it's minus grad p plus mu del squared v. And this leads us to the Navier-Stokes equations for an incompressible fluid, named after two people, Sir George Gabriel Stokes, who was master, master of Pembroke College, Cambridge, and also the Lucasian Professor of Mathematics at Cambridge, the same post that Newton held, the same post that Stephen Hawking held. And we have Claude Louis Navier, who was a French mathematician in the 1700s, and he was a student of Joseph Fourier, who you'll know from Fourier's series. So two eminent and distinguished mathematicians 
and engineers. So, let's look at the Navier-Stokes equations. They're non-linear in velocity. Have a look at these orange terms, v dot grad v, the same term that dropped out of the spatial acceleration consideration in Cauchy's momentum equation. Effectively, this is quadratic in velocity because we've got velocity dot producted with a velocity gradient. And so that can be interesting when we come to solve this equation numerically. We're not going to see any instances where we have to solve elements of v dot grad v analytically. More about that in the parts of this lesson that follow. We've just written one equation here in vector notation for the Navier-Stokes equations. But remember, if we look at that term in blue, the body forces, Fg, that's a vector. And we know we can only add vectors to other vectors. So we know that grad P is also a vector because the gradient operator is a vector, even though P is a scalar. We know that del squared of a velocity field is going to end up, well, del squared is a scalar, but the velocity field is a vector, so that's vector. And so what we have in this one equation are as many coupled partial differential equations as you have directions in your coordinate system. In this case, three, because we're dealing with 3D space. So these equations are applicable to all flows of incompressible Newtonian fluids. Ordinarily, if you want to apply these equations to any arbitrary geometry, you're going to need to solve them numerically. And there is the whole realm of computational fluid dynamics, which, although fascinating, is not one that we're going to explore on this course. What we're going to do in the final parts of this lesson that follow are examine very, very special cases where these equations can be simplified to something that is analytically soluble. In your notes, I have given the full expansion of the Navier-Stokes equations in Cartesian coordinate systems, in cylindrical polar coordinate systems, and in spherical polar coordinate systems. And so what you have there is a resource to save you having to expand out each of these terms in each of the different coordinate systems. So let's recap a few key points. What we did was to start with Cauchy's momentum equation and end up with the equations of motion for an incompressible Newtonian fluid, the Navier-Stokes equations. And we took two steps. We expanded the description of surface forces and the stresses that gave rise to surface forces to include the effects of static surface forces, the effects of pressure, and also the effects of deformation, the dynamic surface forces. We then used the incompressible Newtonian constitutive equation to link shear stress and material deformation via this material property that we call viscosity. And we ended up with three coupled partial nonlinear differential equations that are called the Navier-Stokes equations. And we'll be looking how we solve these and a framework that we can use to solve them easily for certain cases in the next part of this lesson.